Macaron. If I hadn't missed the bus, none of this would have happened. I know that the driver saw me making a dash for the doors, but he was one of those Paris bus drivers who take a particular pleasure in pulling away when they can leave someone panting on the sidewalk. The weather was on the Paris default setting, gray, damp, and chilly. I was wearing a royal blue cashmere coat with a fox collar that kept the wind off my neck. And of course, I was carrying one of my designer tote bags. I can't remember which one. Even then, I had several. I had just bought some macarons at the Pierre Hermé shop on the Rue Bonaparte. Given the dreary weather, I hoped that the brilliantly colored pastries would brighten up my day. I was running late because I had to stand behind a group of Japanese tourists. A visit to Paris is on everyone's bucket list, but still, it's annoying to find tourists every place you want to go. One of my friends thinks that boutiques ought to have two lines, one for residents and one for tourists. This idea has not caught on yet. As I stood at the bus stop, wondering if I'd have time to pluck one of those delicious macarons out of the package, someone said, it's a shame the bus driver didn't stop. Not very nice. The voice belonged to a man with dark red hair and whose skin was the color of burnished gold. I have red hair, lighter than his, and my skin is pale and freckled. The thought flashed through my mind that our looks were complimentary. That's for sure, I replied. He was so attractive that I was at a loss for what else to say. Then I remembered my package. I needed something to eat. Would you like a macaron, I asked, as I pulled out a plastic tube with the macaron lined up like little jewels. Here, try one. Why, thank you, mademoiselle. And he deftly opened the package, extracted a little yellow orb. I love passion fruit, he said with a smile. And he took the tube from my hand and held it out to me. The next macaron was green, pistachio one of my favorites. A bus was coming up the street. Oh, there's my bus, I said. He was so attractive, I wondered if I shouldn't offer him another macaron. But then the bus pulled up and the doors opened. I couldn't just stand there. As I moved to hop on, I felt him so close that I could smell his cologne. I think it was a lure for men. Look, can I repay your generosity and buy you a drink? Here's my card. Call me when you're free. When I returned to my apartment, the first thing that I did was to make a pot of tea to accompany my macaron. It had turned darker, it had started to rain, and I savored the feeling in my mouth of the crunchy meringue mixing with the creamy filling. I put Bernard's card, his name was Bernard Nagel, on my desk next to my computer. One of my clients had sent me a rush job, a translation of their website into French. It was one of those sites selling expensive accessories online. And as I love anything that has to do with fashion, I threw myself into the work. It was not until noon the next day that I finished the job. There's a charcuterie just downstairs from my apartment. And I ran out to buy some lunch and of course, a little tarte aux pommes to tide me over until the evening. Like most Paris apartments, my place is not very spacious. And after lunch, I spent some time straightening out and putting things away. My desk was now clear, and I looked at Bernard Nagel's card. There wasn't much to read, just his name and a cell phone number. Out of curiosity, I Googled him and checked LinkedIn and Facebook, but found no trace of my new friend. Discretion is the better part of valor. Prudence et mère de sûreté was one of my mother's favorite expressions. She said it so frequently that she finished by getting on my nerves, but I thought that this time she would have been right. So I threw the card out and forgot about Bernard Nagel. 
A week later, I was back on Rue Bonaparte window shopping. I like to check out the boutiques in Saint-Germain and then go to Rue d'Alesia to find the same looks at half the price. Pierre Hermé's macaron beckoned, and after treating myself, I stopped in a cafe on Place Saint-Sulpice. I ordered a double espresso and carefully slipped a macaron onto my lap. There was no point in paying for the cafe's pastries when my own were so near to hand and so much better. I looked into the mirror facing me and saw, just a table away, Bernard Noggle and a blonde woman having what seemed like an animated discussion. I usually carry a book with me, but this time I had none. On the table next to mine, someone had left one of those free magazines where people place ads for apartments, jobs, friendship, and whatever else they are looking for. I lowered my face into the magazine, pretending to read it, trying to hear what they were saying. I did my part, and now it's up to you. That was the woman talking. Yes, honey, I know, it's just a matter of time. But Robert, why is it taking so long? Look, I can approach them, but I can't come on too strong. Women with money tend to be suspicious. Still, whom are you waiting on? There's one babe, not a youngster, but still good looking, that I picked up a few days ago. We're going to meet for coffee tomorrow. Is that all? Suppose she doesn't bite. Well, there's another one that I chatted up last week. I had no time to get her number, but I'm sure she's going to call. I could tell by the way she looked at me. What did she look like? Up to your exacting standards, I imagine. The woman chuckled. Oh, she'll do. Full-bodied, I would say. She offered me a macaron. Can you believe that? He laughed. My cheeks were burning. He was talking about me. Without thinking, I shoved the little magazine into my tote bag and stood up. The uneaten macaron rolled off my lap and onto the floor. The table scraped on the tile floor as I tried to slide out. At that moment, Bernard Noggle, or Robert, or whoever he was, turned his head in my direction. Well, hello there, he called out. You're the macaron lady, remember me? The blonde stared at me, a smile frozen on her face. I looked straight at him. I'm sorry, but I think you're confusing me with someone else. Bernardo Robert pushed his chair back and started to rise. No, no, he began. We met right outside. You are quite mistaken, sir. I have raised my voice. Robert, said his companion, sit down. You're embarrassing yourself. My legs felt wobbly, but I managed to walk out of the cafe, still clutching that free magazine. I hailed a taxi, something that I rarely did, as I was living month to month at that time. I don't know why, but while I was in the cab, I skimmed the help wanted section and saw an ad for a translator to work for a magazine called Artixia. I folded the page, and when I got home, I called the number in the ad. I got the job. That was how I met Jacques Mornay and Alex and Eugene, and how I wound up inheriting Blondel's apartment. But that's another story. I've never felt comfortable with Facebook. It too closely resembles the world described in Dave Eggers' book, The Circle, so while other people kill time or procrastinate on Facebook, I read the news online. A few weeks after my encounter with Bernard or Robert, although I guess I can refer to him as Robert now, I read an article that described how the police had arrested a couple that manipulated both women and men into having sex, photographed them, and then blackmailed them. They targeted people who looked as though they could pay. It's kind of ironic because, as I said earlier, at the time I had no money to speak of, just a closet full of clothes that I couldn't afford 
but felt that I had to have. I've lost my taste for macaron. They remind me of Robert and his companion and the bullet that I dodged.